Uh, good afternoon. Many of you will have been in this hall before, as we have also been, for graduations, convocations, and so on. And I must have been here at least 20 times. But I have to say, I've never seen so many uh, camera lights go on. And uh, I can see that Mr. Ban is truly a celebrity. So many people earlier wanted to take selfies with you. When you walked in, so many cameras clicked. Now, this might not be exactly what you get in New York with Donald Trump and so on, and what they're saying about the United Nations. But in Singapore, sir, you can see that you are truly welcome, and we truly see the United Nations as a vital institution for Singapore. So to our distinguished speaker, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the United Nations, and Mrs. Ban, Dr. Nolene Hazer, Senior Advisor to the Secretary General, members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of the Singapore Parliament, members of our Board of Trustees of Singapore Management University, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the eighth Ho Rih Hua Leadership in Asia Public Lecture, which will be delivered by His Excellency Ban Ki-moon. This public lecture series was established by my late mother, Mrs. Ho Lien Fung, in memory of my father, Mr. Ho Rih Hua, a former Singapore ambassador and businessman. She hoped it would inspire students and the public by having accomplished leaders from the Asia Pacific region and beyond to share their experiences, insights, and opinions. This series has been graced by eminent thought leaders, including two Singapore prime ministers, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and Mr. Lee Hsien Loong, the first speaker, and our last speaker prior to Mr. Ban, two Nobel Peace Prize laureates, Burma's Aung San Suu Kyi and former South African President, Mr. Frederick de Klerk, and other eminent leaders such as former President, Mr. Benigno Aquino of the Philippines and former Prime Minister of Malaysia, Dr. Mahathir Mohamad. Mr. Ban Ki-moon is the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations. Born in the Republic of Korea in 1944, Mr. Ban received a bachelor's degree in international relations from Seoul National University in 1970, and subsequently a master's degree in public administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. He has spent 37 years of his life at the Korean Foreign Ministry with postings to India, Europe, and the US, and was Korea's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade at the time of his election as Secretary General. Having grown up during the Korean War, Mr. Ban has said, and I quote, I saw the United Nations help my country to recover and rebuild. That experience was a big part of what led me to pursue a career in public service. As Secretary General, I'm determined to see this organization deliver tangible, meaningful results that advance peace development, and human rights." Unquote. Mr. Ban took office on 1st of January 2007, was unanimously re-elected by the General Assembly in 2011, and will continue to serve until the end of this year. Established over 70 years ago at the end of the Second World War in order to consolidate peace and promote international justice, human rights, and the rule of law, the fundamental values that underpinned the founding of the United Nations are challenged as never before. In addition, previously lesser problems such as intolerance, discrimination, religious extremism, and terrorism are on the rise, and nations have discovered they cannot combat these independently. Ironically, of course, critics of the United Nations and multilateralism are in fact calling for more isolationism and unilateralism. For small states like Singapore, however, the United Nations remains one of the most important defenders of international peace, security, and the rule of law. The UN is a vital forum for small voices to be heard and for regional groupings such as ASEAN to occupy a larger stage. Mr. Ban has been a true friend of Singapore and those who believe in peaceful solutions to resolve global problems. Sir, since your first election as Secretary General 10 years ago, you've continually mobilized global leaders and the United Nations community 
to promote sustainable development, empower women, support chronically unstable and impoverished countries, and generate a new momentum on arms control and disarmament and nuclear non-proliferation. You have also publicly said that you would like to be remembered for your work on global warming, gender equality, and reform of the UN organization. A Straits Times article just two days ago written by a former Singapore permanent representative to the United Nations, Professor Tommy Koh, has helpfully outlined your specific achievements in these fields. I presume that our audience here has read that very insightful article. As for Singapore Management University, we are proud to have our own United Nations Students Association to promote knowledge of the UN and its ideals. In fact, SMU's inaugural Global Model United Nations Conference will be held next month. We're also the only university in Singapore to prominently mark UN Peace Day, which last year was celebrated by SMU students of 40 over different nationalities with the planting of our own permanent peace pole in the university grounds. The SMU School of Law, together with its partners, was selected by the UN Working Group on Human Rights and Transnational Corporations to submit a report, which we did last year. We also partnered with the UN Commission on International Trade Law and other parties to organize several other different events. Our business school has also published a case study on the UN High Commission for Refugees, or UNHCR. And we are particularly proud that two Singapore women who have prominently contributed to the United Nations, Ms. Janet Lim with the UNHCR and Ms. Nolene Hazer with SCAP, are active and valuable members of our advisory panels or trustees of our various institutes. It is therefore with great interest that we look forward to Mr. Barnes' address and the subsequent exchange of views. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. Honorable Chairman Ho Guan Ping, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of Singapore Management University, thank you very much for inviting me and for your very kind introduction. Uh, Professor Arnold de Meyer, President of Singapore Management University, Professor Lily Kong, Provost of the SMU, Honorable Members of the Singaporean Government, and civil service, Your Excellencies, distinguished members of the diplomatic corps, distinguished faculty members, dear students, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Thank you all for being here today. I am very much impressed by this such a big uh, gathering. This seems to be one of the biggest gatherings I ever addressed as a Secretary General of the United Nations. <laughs> this is, in fact, a much bigger chamber than the United Nations General Assembly Hall. <laughs> I can address only to 1,600, including gallery. Then I know that there are a few thousand uh, Particularly, I am very much uh, pleased to, to see so many young students, the leaders of future, for whose visions and future I'm going to discuss with you today. And I, again, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be back in Singapore for a third time as a Secretary General. And as you know, uh, this is one of few last months for me as a Secretary General. I'm going to uh, retire 
uh, by the end of this uh, December. And very pleased to be able to come back to uh, Singapore to express my deepest appreciation for all what Singaporean people and government have been doing for the United Nations, working together with the United Nations for peace and security development and human rights. Singapore is a model, a shining model country of the United Nations. And you should be very proud of what you have been doing. And I expect that my successor and the leaders of this great country and people will continue to work with the United Nations. Ladies and gentlemen, in fact, I'm eager to enjoy another taste of Rojak. <laughs> it's a pleasure to spend more time here in this diverse and dynamic little red dot on the map. Since my last visit in 2012, you celebrated the 50th anniversary of Singapore's anniversary, independence. I was unable to attend the celebration, but I was here in spirit. You may be aware, Secretary General of the United Nations is often referred to as just SG, the same as Singapore's internet domain name. <laughs> so imagine my surprise when I saw the logo that was developed for Singapore's milestone SG50. You are now SG51. I'm SG71. <laughs> but still, I hope that someone can find the button or a banner for me to take home as a souvenir. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, it's a great honor to join you at this distinguished university. I know many eminent people, as have been introduced by Chairman Ho, who have spoken here in this Hori Hua lecture, established in the, na in the name of the esteemed businessman, diplomat, and patriot. I'd like to thank Singapore Management University uh, for its outstanding efforts to train new generations of global leaders. Allow me to start by offering condolences to the people of Singapore on the passing of former President Esal Natan, a much admired global statesman. Beyond his role in Singapore, he was also a good friend of the United Nations. As he once said, I quote, the importance of the United Nations to a small country like Singapore is obvious. We are plugged into the global economy and consequently are highly dependent on international stability for our growth and prosperity. The United Nations has made for a safer and better world, unquote. We thank him for his service. And we thank all Singaporeans uh, for their contributions to the United Nations and to global peace and prosperity. Singaporean nationals have served with distinction in many capacities across the world. I was especially pleased to appoint one of the Singapore's most distinguished women, Dr. Nolien Hazam, who is here with us as the first woman to head the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific, ESCAP. Singapore continues to show that a small state can have a big impact. I often been saying that Singapore, small country, that's true, but you have a big heart and big impact. That's what I'm going to discuss with you later. Thanks to far-sighted investment in education, healthcare, jobs, housing, and public transport, you rank high in global lists that measure human development and gender equality. 
You are a leader in sustainable urbanization uh, through pioneering efforts encompassing water management, green buildings, and much more. I look forward to my visit tomorrow to the gardens by the bay. We will count on Singapore to contribute its expertise towards a successful Habitat 3 conference in October in Quito, Ecuador. You are on the cutting edge of innovation, energy efficiency to waste management. And at a time of global divisions, you continue to build a prosperous society of tolerance and coexistence. Singapore is also a force of regional stability and solidarity through its involvement in ASEAN. You have amplified your voice through the Forum of Small States Force and the Global Governance Group, GGG. Most recently, you have partnered with the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, to establish the Global Center for Public Service Excellence, and I thank you for uh, such uh, support. We are also working together towards the Responsible Business Forum scheduled to take place here in Singapore in late November. Next week, Singapore hosts a major international conference on responsible investing. Responsible business practices are at the heart of global compact initiative, and I welcome the network of important signature a Singapore-based companies that is active pursuing this agenda. Thank you for this wide-ranging global citizenship. I am here to express my deepest appreciation and to explore together one more a Singapore can do across our agenda. All spectrums of United Nations Charter, peace and security, development, and human rights. In that spirit, I would like to highlight a number of areas where your contributions can make an important uh, difference. Ladies and gentlemen, Singapore strongly supports the shaping and adopting of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, what's known as SDGs, our new landmark framework for ending poverty and ensuring lives of dignity for all on a healthy planet. This 17 Sustainable Development Goals covers all spectrums of our life, not only people, but our planet Earth. This is the most far-reaching, ambitious vision which member states of the United Nations have adopted September last year for people, peace, planet, and prosperity, and partnership. All these five Ps, I hope you will remember. Peace, prosperity, partnership, and people and planet. They cover all people, all the spectrums of our life. Even the wealthiest and most powerful societies have yet to conquer inequality, discrimination, and environmental uh, degradation. Singapore can play a very important role as you have been doing during the last uh, five decades. Now I'm calling on all member states to align their policies, their domestic policies, programs, and spending behind this sustainable development agenda. That is the message I'll bring to the G20 leaders later this week in Hangzhou, China. Asia's robust economic growth helped the world cut poverty by half. But there is so much more uh, to be done. Two of three, every three of the world's poorest people call Asia home. This is a still sad reality. That is why 
Asia must embrace this 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. We need a true global partnership of nations, organizations, businesses, and communities to fulfill the agenda's core promise to leave no one behind. Basic, the most important philosophical theme of this SDG is that no one should be left behind, regardless of where you are coming from, regardless of your racial, ethnic, or gender. Everybody must be on board. That is what SDG is aiming. Ladies and gentlemen, again, another very important agenda and vision the world leaders have adopted December last year in Paris is historic climate change agreement, which have been negotiating over two decades. Tackling climate change is essential for sustainable development. The actions needed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and build climate resilience are among those that are needed to implement the 2030 Agenda and to set the world on course for prosperity and security. Climate change is one of the 17 goals. Number 13 is climate change. If we look at the 17 goals, the world member states of the United Nations have structured these 17 goals in a way that this climate change and all these remaining 16 goals must go hand in hand. Nothing out of 17 can function in separation, in isolation. All 17 goals uh, must be implemented and must proceed in parallel, all together. In that regard, I welcome Singapore's commitment to stabilize emissions. Singapore is an increasingly green city, generating both cleaner energy and lessons for others. Singapore was among the record number of member states that signed the Paris Agreement in April. Now we need to bring that agreement into force. We need, there are two triggers which have trigger provisions which can make this climate change agreement effective. 55 countries and 55% of global greenhouse gas emissions, all these should be put together. As of today, 22 countries have already ratified, but the greenhouse gas emissions accounted for by these 22 countries just goes 1.08%. That means that these 22 countries are very clean countries. Singapore's greenhouse gas emission in global setting is just 0.10%. So Singapore is also a very clean country. I asked Foreign Minister Balakrishna today that Singapore should be one of the first 55 countries. I'm sure that uh, they will do it. I very much hope that we can see this Paris Agreement can enter into force uh, before the end of this year. That's my ambition. I think it can be done, and I'm very much hopeful. Many major economies, including the United States and China, who can make up for 38% by two, only by two countries, have committed to join or ratify the agreement uh, this year. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, during, the generous, uh, during this uh, G7, G20 summit meeting, I will press for more support from other countries, particularly the countries participating in G20. Singapore is, um, is participating in G20 summit meeting. And on, on September 21st, I have convened a special event, special summit meeting where I have invited the leaders of the world 
who can submit the instrument of ratification uh, to me on that day, or who can at least express their intention that they will ratify it by the end of this year. I invite again Singapore to attend and deposit its instrument of ratification. Can you give a big approach to Singapore government so that they can listen? I, I sincerely hope that the senior government officials, I know that Permanent Secretary Albert Chua is sitting with many other senior government officials, will have taken note of your urgent appeal to the government. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at a time of significant global challenges, the 2030 Agenda and Paris Agreement I have been a boost, have been a boost to multilateralism and have given us hope that we can overcome other global divisions in the name of the common good. We must turn that hope into results. And in addressing today's vast agenda of unresolved conflict and unending sufferings, conflicts and protracted crisis pose a grave risk to our ability to deliver on the promise of 2030 agenda. From Syria to South Sudan, from the Sahel to Libya and Yemen, violence is shattering the lives and forcing millions from their own homes. Violent extremism and terrorism is on the rise. The increasing links between terrorist groups, organized crime syndicates, and drug traffickers have made conflicts less amenable to negotiated settlements and more catastrophic for civilians. At least at this time, 130 million people need humanitarian assistance. United Nations has to provide daily humanitarian assistance to these people. And on top of this, we have 65 million people who have been forcibly displaced from their homes. This is the highest number of people who have been displaced, either refugees or internally displaced. That's the highest number since the end of Second World War. Nearly half these people in despair are children and young people. Is there anything more urgent than saving these young people from becoming a lost generation? In May, I convened again world, for the first time World Humanitarian Summit meeting in Istanbul, Turkey. Humanitarian and development partners agreed on a new way of working aimed at reducing the need for humanitarian action by investing in resilient communities and stable uh, societies. Governments committed to do more to prevent conflict and to uphold international humanitarian law. I continue to press all member states of the United Nations to find the political solution that are so vital to reduce humanitarian needs around the world. On September 19, the General Assembly of the United Nations will convene a UN summit on refugees and migrants. This will be an opportunity to come up with a blueprint for better international response. We must do more to save lives, crack down on smugglers, and counter those who seek votes by exploiting fear and divisiveness. Crucially, we must convey a key message. Far from being a threat, refugees and migrants contribute uh, to the growth and development of host countries as well as their countries of origin. 
we are deeply concerned for a lot of discrimination and xenophobia and violence against those refugees and displaced people who had no other alternatives but to flee their countries, flee, flee their homes, then it's only natural that those countries, receiving countries, they should receive and extend caring, a warm, caring hands. Beating these peace and security challenges is our common, common goal. I encourage countries such as Singapore with their expertise and prosperity to engage actively in UN peace operations and help us address the roots of conflict, prevent violent extremism, and address other threats. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to offer a few thoughts on a number of regional matters of mutual concern to Singapore and the United Nations. In the days ahead, tomorrow, I'll be visiting Myanmar to meet with the country's new leaders and attend the opening of the 21st Panglong, 21st Century Panglong Conference, an important step in the country's transition. Last November's election in Myanmar opened the potential for an inclusive, harmonious, multi-ethnic, and multi-religious democracy. The new leadership must now overcome discrimination, ensure equality, and promote inclusive development for all with a full respect for human rights. The recent establishment of a commission on Rakhine State, headed by my predecessor, Kofi Annan, is an encouraging step. I thank Singapore for supporting Myanmar's new path, continued backing by Singapore and the wider international community will be critical. And in the South China Sea, tensions remain a source of serious concern. Provocations and misunderstandings could escalate and put the harmony the region has sought for so long at risk. I have consistently called on all involved to resolve these disputes through peaceful dialogue in accordance with the universally recognized principles of international law. I have also expressed the hope that a code of conduct may be elaborated to lead to increased mutual understanding. ASEAN, for its part, continues to make progress towards the integrated, peaceful, and stable community in Southeast Asia, including through closer ties with the United Nations. Next week, I'll be traveling to Laos to attend the ASEAN UN Summit. The United Nations will continue working with Singapore in that context as well. It will be important to align ASEAN's Vision 2025 behind the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I welcome the establishment of the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights and the development of an ASEAN Human Rights Declaration. This can help strengthen the region's response to troubling instances of rising intolerance and shrinking democratic space in a number of Asian countries. Ladies and gentlemen, the situation on the Korean Peninsula is a further challenge. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea continues to take very worrying action, including submarine-launched ballistic missiles test most recently. The North Korea's pursuit of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles cast a shadow over the region. Not only are such actions a clear violation of relevant Security Council resolutions, but they also undermine 
peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula and in the greater Asia Pacific region. We must find the path back to, to denuclearization through sincere dialogue. I stand ready to contribute in any way that might be helpful. More broadly, I hope that the region will move beyond long-standing differences, uh, border disputes, and conflicting interpretations of history. It would be tragic for Asia to let the past hold it back. The vision must look ahead to our shared common future. Chairman Ho Kwon Ping, distinguished faculties, dear young students, ladies and gentlemen, I have set out a full agenda for Singapore and Asia and the world. But in fact, there are limited agenda when it comes to our challenges which we have to face as the United Nations and all member states of the United Nations. But your esteemed institutions, your college, your university, will continue to play an important role in helping young people contribute their talents to our common enterprise. My hope is that, along with the leadership and managerial skills acquired here, students will be schooled, will also be schooled in compassion and solidarity. There are half of this population, they are young people but their average age is under 25. That means that this global society is still very young. But not much attention has been given to our succeeding generation, particularly young people and women. Therefore, United Nations has been taken as a priority, one of my priorities as a Secretary General, to work for and with, with young people and women. That has been one of my five pri top priorities as a Secretary General of the United Nations. And I'm sure that United Nations will pay more, much more attention on that. Having seen so many young people sitting here, the leaders of this country and leaders of this world must do much more how we can provide them the decent work opportunities and decent political, social, economic opportunities so that they can fully demonstrate and contribute their potential. We normally say that they are the leaders of tomorrow, but there are many young people who have taken their leadership already today. It is only natural that we have to provide much more so. There are 73 million young people who are jobless. And there are 60, more than 60 million young people who are out of school. We have to do much more. That is why, for the first time in the history of the United Nations, I appointed, for the first time again, UN Secretary General's envoy for youth. He was 28 years old when I appointed him. Now he is 32 years old. Then this month, <coughs> August 12th, on the occasion of International Day of Youth, I appointed a very distinguished former Prime Minister of Austria as my special envoy on youth employment to address this 73 million jobless young people. With all together, we have to do much more. And I'm asking young people, I think you have unlimited potentiality to contribute yourself. And government and this, our generation and young generation should combine their commitment and their energy for the better, better world. Those are the qualities that will enable Singapore and the United Nations to secure future we want. 
Ladies and gentlemen, again, let us work together to make this world better form where everybody, men and women, or poor and rich, young and old, can live sustainably, peacefully in this planet Earth. I thank you for your attention and thank you very much for your commitment. Thank you.